welcome to Short Story Boudoir. I'm Katie Gathright. And I'm Samantha Neukabauer. And this is another episode where we're diving deep into one short story because you can always read one story <laughs> and talk about it with a friend and obviously enjoy treats afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and so today we are going to be talking about a story called Hummels by mm -hmm. John Darcy. Mm -hmm. It was actually just published uh, very recently mm -hmm. in the fall, winter 2022, 2020, sorry, 2023, 2024 um issue of evergreen magazine yes. mm -hmm. uh, so this is the most contemporary Absolute story that we terrain for discussed. us yeah mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting um and it was an exciting find for both of us so um this is a story where we follow a protagonist named mark mm -hmm. and the story kicks off when he gets a phone call from his wife martha we later learn that they are estranged they're separated mm -hmm. they're kind of going through right. something with their marriage um but the phone call is to say that her mother passed away mm -hmm. and then we kind of get a series of reflections both in the present timeline mm -hmm. and some flashbacks to the past past moments in their relationship mm -hmm. um and the story kind of revolves around this sort of strange thing that they've inherited <laughs> in the present which is her mother's collection of hummels right and hummels are these tiny like childlike figurines mm -hmm. um and they have literally thousands of them and so mm -hmm. they're sort of this Thing they have to contend with in the present which is what to do mm -hmm. with all of these hummels mm -hmm. um and so there's one kind of final long mm -hmm. climactic scene where they are dealing with the hummels mm -hmm. in the garage mm -hmm. and then the protagonist mark has a flashback to his time um, when he was in the army and had mm -hmm. this kind of formative incident mm -hmm. around a fire that i'm sure we'll talk more about mm -hmm. um and then the story kind of culminates with them sort of test throwing one of the Hummels into a fire pit in the backyard. So um, if it sounds pretty plotty, it's not actually no. a super plotty story. It's pretty, um, there's a lot of interiority and a lot of reflection that paces mm -hmm. it kind of throughout, but I know you have some thoughts on kind of yes. the overall shape and flow here. So we can kind of get into that. Yeah, so I was really excited when I came across this story when um, reading this review because it has a lot of heft to it, which yeah. um, you don't always see, you know, or it feels to me sometimes you don't see as much in the contemporary, um, you know, recently published work. Um, and in some ways that's because it feels very conventional structurally in yeah. a way, right? So, you know, um, from the line level, you know, to the scene level, I feel the way that Darcy parcels um, information or, or content um, has that kind of traditional feel to it. Yeah. We get, you know, so much dialogue, so much flashback, so much interior monologue, so much plot and action. Yeah. Um, and it, it made me think a lot about how this kind of conventional structure was shaping my experience of the mm -hmm. story itself yeah. and its themes and what it's about. Um, and it made me think of this um, advice that the writer Joy Williams had related in, in an interview not so long ago, um, where she said that the important thing for a writer, especially short stories, is to keep the work from becoming what it's really about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is a story about a death and inheritance and I love that how it kind of the story itself asks so many questions about what we do with inheritance both the material aspects and the spiritual aspects yeah. and then almost so on the nose in a way it was about the marriage and I was yeah. like well, I don't think this is what Joy Williams is talking about exactly and then as we kind of step through the story we get this you know explosive kind of unexpected paragraph um, about this kind of incident when he was in service. And I was like, wow, like this changes all my thoughts on how traditional it is. It almost like yeah. Janice headed it three ways instead of two. Um, it was the theme under the theme under the theme. And that really impressed me. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree. I mm -hmm. think that's sort of, we talk sometimes about like a moment when the story breaks open yeah. for you. And mm -hmm. I do think that, mm -hmm felt the same way for yeah. me when I was reading it. It's sort of like you're reading along and it, mm -hmm. there are moments even where the prose feels very kind of like mid-century in a very, you know, in a very um, talented way. Like it right. feels like, Absolutely. you know, reading a lot of the classic yeah. writers that feels, you... Yeah, like someone, this is someone who has read a lot of the same Richard Ford, yes. Hunter O'Connor that I have read and loved. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know? And it's, it's familiar mm -hmm. and it's like the rhythm of it feels familiar yeah. and conventional mm -hmm. like you're saying, but then, yeah, it really kind of backs away mm -hmm. from that with this 
memory of his time in service and it is like one long mm -hmm. chunky paragraph right it's actually a little bit like difficult to follow in right. ways it feels like something that we don't actually have like complete access to right. whereas and a lot of other parts of the story I actually feel like I have a very good grasp of this man's mm -hmm. psychology he's absolutely you know floundering a little bit in places but he's able to articulate it with like really precise metaphors mm -hmm. and it all feels very like knowable mm -hmm. um until that moment yeah right. yeah and that moment even has like a strange act of repetition in it that has yeah. to do with the door opening and and almost closing both at the beginning and the end again of this kind of visually large paragraph that felt both um symbolic in retrospect um but also made the paragraph a little hard to understand exactly what was happening i don't know if you had that experience yeah i did and mm -hmm. so like i'm sure i think i don't know i think it's helpful to bring up because you may have had an experience <laughs> to reading the story where it's you know you're trying to visualize like there's a sort of like a truck that's on mm -hmm. fire and you're trying to visualize exactly what's happening mm -hmm. with it um and it is a little bit difficult to trace, which I think you can read as like purposeful or not potentially. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, going back to your sort of question or your prompt about Joy Williams saying stories mm -hmm. being like, you know, you want to avoid having it be too much about right. what it's about. Um, you know, there were questions I had about, you know, does the story land in a place where it's ultimately a, about that time mm -hmm. when he was in service more mm -hmm. or not, you know? and. I was reminded of um, the story we read a couple episodes ago, which was Phil Clyde's mm -hmm. redeployment, mm -hmm. um, which was also a story about a veteran where the veteran experience was much closer to the surface the entire length mm -hmm. of the story, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a story where um, it didn't back into that topic right. at all, right? It was sort mm -hmm. of all about that, whereas mm -hmm. this story, it sort of um, is mentioned kind of at the beginning in mm -hmm. a sort of almost understated way where you know, Mark sort of makes reference to a couple of his army buddies that right. died of despair, which is actually a, quite a mm -hmm. like arresting moment in the story, but it's right. passed over pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's really not till almost the end where we kind of get that long, you know, memory mm -hmm. of the fire scene. So right. anyway, I'm just curious if you felt like how you would compare the treatment mm -hmm. of his like veteran experiences right. to the Phil Kai story or whether you feel like that is what this story is right. about. Well, I think for me, what's interesting is how this is someone who's been out of the service longer than the protagonist in that story. Um, yeah. And so dealing with kind of the inheritance of that experience um, is different because they're at a different stage of it. And yeah. I think personally, I go to literature sometimes to see how to make sense of these kind of different longer term things that have happened. It's yeah. One of the many reasons, but you know, and so for me, this was uh, more powerful and interesting in a way because the other story is so red hot in that moment of return. Yeah. And, and I like that about it. Sure. But I personally am more interested in how, you know, people kind of live with all the detritus of their life in a <laughs> yeah. long-term way. Yeah. And in a way that I feel like the scope of this story ends up being really big, Absolutely. right? It sort of feels mm -hmm. about like, how do you compose a life in the end, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. I sort of feel like the ending really points us in that direction where, you know, he's talking about um, there's sort of like this metaphorical moment happening mm -hmm. with the Hummel right. and turning into ash and the fire, and he's talking about, oh, it's getting there. And we mm -hmm. feel like, okay, he's yeah. sort of getting there with his own life. And it feels much broader than mm -hmm. just, oh, recovering from, right. you know, experience in the army. It feels like, yeah, that was probably formative, but mm -hmm. I also feel like we're just talking about his entire psychology. Right. And so I think the story feels, I don't know, it's both traditional and mm -hmm. unconventional in right. a way. I feel like <laughs> it's like, it feels conventional to have a, um, a complicated you know, right. protagonist, mm -hmm. a male character mm -hmm. who like, I don't know, has like, sharp edges but also like a lot of introspection and softness and right. you get to kind of see all those angles like that feels familiar right but it also feels kind of fresh now to read a story that's not like oh we, we have a trauma plot and it's right. just about him Absolutely kind of recovering not. Mm -hmm. from something like right. that it's really not it's not a ptsd story mm -hmm. um and so i'm interested in that i'm interested in that too because i feel like this almost that like kind of spirit of of you know the artistic dove or whatever like yeah. falling on the writer as they're writing this in a way that like 
I don't feel always from stories that are like this is you know a story about X or yeah. Y. Um, you can almost see kind of the starting line from where they began the story, but I have a hard time kind of picturing where he started in the story. Yeah, right? I like, agree. and that is exciting to me. Yeah, so, it like yeah. evolves. It mm -hmm. feels like it has kind of yeah. a mind of its own, which is exciting. Yeah, there's a line um, earlier in the story before we get the significant scene from his service days where him and his wife, when they're still together, I think are trying to, you know, make it work and they're doing the kind of Pacific Coast mm -hmm. Highway um, drive. And he says about her, she had a smile like a roadside bomb. And it feels so much more earned, yeah. right? Like as a, a simile, um, after we get that story and after I really started registering that this was a person who has this past. Yeah. Um, but I could see like a, a line like that appearing in, you know, dozens of stories yeah. that do not have um, a veteran um, as their protagonist or a veteran thinking it. Yeah. And because of these kind of stylistic choices he made, it just adds so much more heft to every line. Lines like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. And I think it's lines like that too um, that make me feel the following way, which is when I was thinking about the story mm -hmm. and like getting ready for our conversation, I had this like misremembrance of the story as being first person. Oh, like I actually weirdly, you know, convinced myself that it was mm -hmm. in first person and was going to talk about the first person mm -hmm. narrator. But then I was just, you know, I was rereading yeah. it and I was like, wait a second, exactly. <laughs> like not at all. And I, but I do feel like mm -hmm. it feels like you use the word earned. Mm -hmm. I think it feels really lived in in mm -hmm. terms of his experience, even though we do get a lot about Martha as well. Right. It's not, you know, completely a one-hander or anything, mm -hmm. um, but it does feel very personal. It does, and I think that um, that's why the story will probably stay for, stay with me, yeah. you know? It's definitely um, that, that it's that I love the close third, Yeah. right? I think that it's it's such a great, great POV for a short story. Yeah, and ultimately gets you a lot you know, closer in a lot of instances. Absolutely. Um, so something I'm interested in talking yeah. about has to actually do with the review itself, um, which if you're not familiar with Evergreen Review, um, it's um, it's a literary magazine that was started in the 50s. Um, it published kind of giants uh, like Susan Sontag and Ginsburg and Henry Miller. So it's always had, you know, this um, great reputation. Um, and what they do with their prose and poetry pieces are that they intersperse visual art um, and illustrations, etc., within the stories. And I haven't seen that much in many places. No, me either. Um, and so this story is paired with um, a, a work by a writer named Nancy Evans. Um, and from what I could see, she has like three different styles that are representative there. So she does both um, both uh, painting um, that's more abstract, and then she does these more figurative sculpture pieces. And then within those sculpture pieces, there were kind of two veins. There was one that was like mystical characters, yeah. like, you know, mermaids and or Merdanas. And then the other that was, uh, that were familiar, like animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're interspersed throughout the text. And it's interesting because, um, you know, especially the sculptures really struck me as really being in an interesting conversation with this. Um, the one I liked most was like this cobra mm -hmm. and it's sort of almost like an effigy or a husk of like the cobra and it feels like melted. Um, I just wanted to really talk about that. Like, did you think of these sculptures while you're reading this or like after it or what? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a cool question. And I think it's something that um, is different mm -hmm. about reading a story yeah. in this format mm -hmm. than you might get otherwise. Right. right. Um, and so to be honest, like, I don't think I thought about the art in conjunction yeah. too much, at least like consciously right. as I was reading yeah. the story the mm -hmm. first time. Um, except to say like there, the art does break up the story in certain ways where there were moments where I actually wondered if the story was over, right. um, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So there were like some interesting pauses in okay. my reading experience mm -hmm. for that reason. But putting that aside, I do think once I read the story and kind mm -hmm. of revisited it, um, the art was an interesting pairing for mm -hmm. me actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, interested particularly in the sculptures mm -hmm. as well so mm -hmm. it's interesting that you feel that way mm -hmm. too um i think there's something about the story being built around the hummels like this very mm -hmm. tactile object where the like sculptural the like images of the sculptures also felt 
very like tactile to right me. like mm -hmm. they were um for me the one that stood out was like the, the blue fish yes, one yeah. and mm -hmm. that felt so like and I, you know, I hope you all go back oh, and look at it, but mm -hmm. um, it feels really like- a link in the bio. Yeah. <laughs> you feel like you really want to like touch it, you yes. know? Um, it feels very like real <laughs> corporal or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that because I mm -hmm. feel like the story is a story that like, again, has all these moments that are kind of reflective mm -hmm. and like feel like they are, start to drift off a little bit, but then it gets anchored again into like, we're in the garage or right. like we are, you know, dealing with, um, mm -hmm all this stuff that your mother <laughs> gave us, you know? So I, I don't know. I, I liked thinking about like the weight of things mm -hmm. and like the way um, physical objects can like, I don't know, really take over or like have their yeah. own gravitational pull. I, I agree. And, and something that I was thinking about it after was there's a line in the story about um, how the Hummels had always been a presence in his mother-in-law's mm -hmm. house, right? And I, it's such a great line. It's like it came on to him like a shock or something. Mm -hmm. He sees them, you know, throughout the house and he is, he's like, I, he just never took them in before. Um, yet they clearly like meant so much to his mother-in-law and she saved them and everything. And I was thinking about that with this art in the background or in the inner place with the story. Like yeah. they're there and you're taking note of them and they mean something and someone took so much time to curate it. Um, and then, you know, I really like this Cobra one. So I ended up taking a screenshot of it and like filing it into the folder of like, you know, animals yeah. I like. And I was like, I am hoarding Hummels right now. Like oh, I am, imagine. you know, doing this thing and then, you know, I really do believe they create this ambiance both yeah. in the internet and in the mother-in-law's house was shaped in this way by this, you know, Bavarian child utopian land or something. Yeah, I really like that. <laughs> That's a cool, um, like, life imitating right. art yeah. kind of moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's the kind of thing that actually would be a reason to revisit the story even again in the mm -hmm. future, just to think right. more about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I am interested in the Hummels themselves, mm -hmm. which I know we keep bringing up, but <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I do think it's worth talking a little bit about like, yeah, how they functioned for mm -hmm. you in the story in general, mm -hmm. because you know, it's the title, it's mm -hmm. sort of the, the spine of the story. Right. It gives the, it gives both the husband and wife something to, to do physically mm -hmm. um, yeah. in the present. So I'm just curious how they struck you. Well, I thought that at first, you know, this is such, you know, you know, it's such a great sy symbolism for writing, right? Like the idea that, you know, you have all these Hummel figurines, which if you're not familiar, definitely look them up. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are mentioned, like here's a child, like as a dentist, yeah. here's a child tuba player, a milkmaid. And, you know, they're kind of playing with them yeah. and imagining the mother having played with them and storing them and all these things. And I'm like, wow, this is so much like writing. This is so kind of meta like that. And, but I do find it on one hand, like very easy to read into stories like yeah. that. Um, but the idea of them as kind of like this symbolism of inheritance and everything, you know, I, it really worked for me, I think, because I am not cynical about symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, our world is full of symbols and I like seeing them appear in the story. I think that I was um, least invested in the Himmels in one particular part yeah. where the protagonist goes online and like looks up about if he can sell them. Uh, yeah. And the reason I felt this way is because I, I, I stepped out of the steering room and I'm like, oh, the writer probably did this. Like the mm -hmm. writer probably like did this. And that was the only time that huh. the Hummel world didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see how that would take you out mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I feel similarly, like I think sometimes the symbol can feel like, oh good, I'm glad you yeah. like thought of that yeah. and mm -hmm. put that in here. Um, and I don't feel allergic to symbolism mm -hmm. in general either. So yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I was bracing myself against them. I think I was curious about, mm -hmm. you know, where it was going to go. Yeah. And I do think in general, like, I don't know if I have anything super interesting to say about mm -hmm. the, like what they symbolize yeah. other than, you know, the <laughs> mm -hmm. inheritance themes yeah. mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what we get that we want or mm -hmm. don't want. Um, but I do think they were really helpful in the story that was, again, like so much about this marriage in the beginning. Mm -hmm that the Hummels helped it not be too much about that. Kind of going back right. to your original mm -hmm. point, you yeah. know? Like, I think that there are moments where I even felt myself being like, 
am I rooting for them to get back together? Mm -hmm. Oh, I sort of see that they are like maybe mm -hmm. spending the night now. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, how interesting, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I don't know. The Hummels were a really great pullback yeah. from yeah. those moments. I was definitely rooting for the Hummels themselves. <laughs> I was like, we should take these to a nursing home, deliver them in each ward. We should take these to a thrift store. I did not want all these Hummels to be burned. No, I thought the weight of them. I was I know. like, oh, I do feel like you need to yeah. hire somebody to, to get ready this way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, for me too, I was thinking about this gif that I've seen floating around a lot. And it's either, I think it's Arthur, but it might be Bernstein Bears, but it's like, you know, capitalism, this is what you imagine like my future would look like. And it's a simplistic photo of like, you know, post office, fire station, like house, you know, school, library, like this very idyllic world. Yeah. And I think that in some ways I was thinking about that with the humbles and what they yeah. symbolize too, right? Like some kind of like pa the pastoral, the, you yeah. know, that is so in inaccessible to these colleagues or colleagues to these, this is couple, yeah. even when they're reaching for it, when they go along the water, you yeah. know, like they can't be swimmer, guy driving along the water, you know? No, I think that really works. Yeah, there's like, mm -hmm. a, every Hummel has, is like a specific role yeah. and has mm -hmm. a like job right. or a little yeah. thing they're carrying that tells you what their right. job is. Like what would the war one look like? Yeah. They don't make the war yeah. one, right? right? And I did read that I thought was interesting that one of the reasons they became really popular apparently was that um, American troops were sending them home from uh, West Germany after oh, the you know that war. Is so there's actually this military connection as well, that's which is cool. interesting. That so, is cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. feels again like traditional in the satisfying way that there are kind Absolutely. of layers to like yeah. why the Hummels were mm -hmm. chosen. Yeah, yeah. And actually, my favorite line has yeah. to do with the Hummels. So maybe I'll read that. We always you know end our episodes that way. Okay. Um, so a reverse Toy Story is just someone playing with toys. She picked up the milkmaid and started galloping it towards the tuba player, walking its space along the floor as though it were a heavy piece of furniture. Like this, she said. She pushed the tuba player in and made him kiss the milkmaid. She made puckering smooch sounds as she forced the two horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like this because there's a failed kiss scene yeah. in this uh, story too, where you know he attempts to kiss her and she recoils with her whole body. Um, it's a good line, but um, you know it's much easier to play with your dolls <laughs> and to play with your characters and make them do the things you want than to actually make real people do them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the story has good dialogue in it. Like it that, does. Mm -hmm. Oh, like a reverse Toy Story mm -hmm. is um, yeah, just someone yeah. playing with toys. Mm -hmm. It's like. You know, Martha has these she tree does. cutting lines, and um, it's great. It yeah, really I agree. injects life into it. Mm -hmm. um, what about you? Okay, my favorite line comes like right at the end after he, after we get that long paragraph of the fire. Memory. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then we say he's kind of like wrapping up that story. Um, quote: The guy from the doorway took off his top and wrapped his hand as he grabbed the knob and flung the door open so hard it nearly closed again. And sitting next to Martha as the fire pit popped, he ran it all back for her, everything he could remember. And um, yeah, I'm interested in this, like the sentence that basically takes us from the end of the story and mm -hmm. transitions us back into the present where okay. he is like back with Martha. So and I'm the Hummels. In. Yes, <laughs> gotta get back to the Hummels. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think it's a really like, uh, really like casual mm -hmm. transition like back to like real world right. um, but even beyond that I'm interested in this fact that like he mentions that he ran it all back um, mm -hmm. for her mm -hmm. and so we're told that he tells this story that we just read mm -hmm. he tells it to Martha mm -hmm. and I'm so interested in like the almost like the secrecy of that mm -hmm. sentence and how like, there's something about him saying that he told it all to Martha that makes me wonder, like, did she get a fuller story than mm -hmm. we did? I know we mentioned earlier how the fire story is, like, a little bit confusing mm -hmm. in ways, and it feels like there are some, like, gaps mm -hmm. in terms of, like, you know, what actually happened. Right. And we know that he almost says, like, I don't know if this is real or not. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, like, layers to the fire right. story anyway. But I think it's really interesting that he almost drops this clue that, like, he told it all to mm -hmm. Martha um, after maybe not telling her ever about mm -hmm. this. 
And I just kind of like thinking that maybe like, maybe Martha got a better version of the story yeah. than we did. Um, mm -hmm. And again, maybe this is just me rooting for them when I shouldn't yeah. be, but I think there's a lot of intimacy mm -hmm. there in knowing that he tells this story to her. Mm -hmm. um, I think that long sentence is kind of dreamy in a way, mm -hmm. the way um, we're, we're told that information. So, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. I like that part. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great call too to think about it as like the transitional piece back mm -hmm. into the present. Um, and if you're you know watching this or reading this as a writer, that is definitely something you want to have in your toolbox, right? Yes. Um, um, and yeah, I love I love that he told Martha something more. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with you on that one. Okay, mm -hmm. great. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> um, that's all I have. What yeah, about you? I think yeah. so too. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, and we will see you next time at your Storyboard Noir. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Happy reading.